Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, get a sneak preview of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center tour. As always, it's a great chance to connect with design and plant combinations for drought. We also take a closer look at a restored habitat right here in town. Daphne's pick of the week is the multitasking perennial Engelman's Daisy, and John Dromgle has your backyard basic tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. When the Stewarts wanted land and wildlife habitat, but also biking distance to downtown, they found the perfect compromise. See how they restored native plants and animals just beyond freeway traffic. In Martin Hills, with Mopac close enough to see, Laura and Andrew Stewart and their daughter Ava aren't far from a nature preserve. It's right out their front door. In 2011, when they built their house on the hillside property's acre and a half, they started restoration of its native roots. After living on 10 acres of habitat near Manor, they wanted to live alongside nature's garden. We realized we like the land, but we don't like living outside the city. So we decided that we would prefer to have something like that, but where we could still ride our bikes downtown and have access to all the things that happen in Austin. The house was designed by Juan Moreau and Miguel Rivera, the Moreau Rivera architects. And I remember the conversation we had when we were talking about the design was like having that flow, you know, opening it up so you didn't feel like you cut the lot in half, that you had a connection from top to bottom. And also that we spend so much of our time outdoors. Um, that we're not really gardeners, we just love being outside. And so, again, the native landscape makes sense for us because it's low maintenance. but. Um, also, just as far as creating this space, we want this to feel like a part of our house or a part of our living space. The trellis sort of functions to, to create that feeling of, of still being in our living space because we do so much of our living out, out here. Well, our architects um, introduced us to David Mahler, who from Environmental Survey Consulting, and they came out and, and he did a plant inventory of all the plants on the property, of all the, the native species we had and all the non-native invasives, and basically proposed that to be able to access the entire lot to, to build a trail system that kind of looped us around so we could go and enjoy the lot and, but not have to bushwhack our way through it. With the trail, it gives you this feeling that you're exploring. To restore the abundant native plants, David Mahler removed invasive exotics that blockaded them. Hidden treasures quickly resurfaced to join the natives, he added. There's not one time where it's like super showy and there's a lot that's happening all at once. It's like little pockets happen here and there, but it happens constantly and changes throughout the year. Every time I walk the trail, I notice something new and that constant flux and the change I like to I like to watch what's happening with the land it's not such a planned garden well it's kind of the sense of like what we did with the whole house a sense of space and and how we interact with the environment around us and it's just a feeling of being connected with nature without having to give up the the perks of living in a city near the house where the family often gathers David designed up-close interactions In a corridor from driveway to house, he clustered native succulents of distinctive coloration and textures. The only turf grass is a terrace that edges the patio. For lawn sports, to play bocce ball, maybe a little badminton, just a little area to have fun, 
And you know, and we went and we went with buffalo grass to try and choose something that was really hardy and drought tolerant that we didn't that looked really good if you decide not to mow it and looked nice if like to cut it as well. And we wanted our daughter to be able and her friends to be able to run around barefoot in the grass, although they run around barefoot on the entire <laughs> <laughs> terrain. So, it, it, you know, things don't always, the spaces aren't always used as you plan to use them. In fact, the dogs use that space probably more than, than anyone else. Donner, Ava, and friends are usually on the trails exploring and collecting seeds. At the bottom of the hill, you might run into them in our playhouse, a 1956 Shasta Airstream. This lower berth of the hill is in full sun, perfect for the kitchen garden where the whole family plants seasonal vegetables. They also started an orchard to pick fruit fresh from their trees. To cool things down, David built a pond. In the summertime, it's very hot down there, but it's just, we wanted to have something that really invited you to enjoy that part of the land as well. And we also just enjoy what ponds bring. All the insects, the bees, the birds. We had a lot of wildlife that goes and enjoys that pond. David also engineered water retention on the hillside to keep rainfall on the property, but away from the house. We have um, rainwater collection. We have a, a, about 10,000 gallon capacity with tanks under the deck, and we capture all the water from the roof, the two roof lines. And then we have built swales and shaped the land around the house and have French drains to move the water around. And then to, when the water does move down the hill, we have swales to slow it down and spread it out. And our irrigation system is connected to the um, rainwater tanks. So if we ever get to the, which has happened very rarely, where we get to 100% full, and instead of letting all the water rush out all in one place, we can spread it around the lot through the irrigation system. Restoring the land's natural cycle may take at least five years, but even in one, the stewards have seen its resilience when unnatural barriers disappeared. But I've been blown away. Like this spring, I just was, I couldn't believe what was happening. And most of it was stuff that was, was not planted. It's just the stuff that was happening here. Just the, the native um, wildflowers that we already have on the lot, that once you cleared things away or cut down saplings or the mountain junipers, that I had the space to come out and, and grow. It's been spectacular. You just want to be able to interact with it and help it along, but not sculpt it, let it sculpt itself. Oh, now that is a cool garden. Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. I love those personalized spaces, and that one was just rich with them. And this could be, of course, featured on the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's Gardens on Tour. And uh, we are now going to be talking about the rest of the tour and how you can participate. Our friend Andrea DeLonga Maya is back on the program. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, this is a, an annual tradition that is a really big deal now in Austin and uh, a really it's wonderful way to celebrate Mother's Day weekend. It's a perfect way, you know, grab your mom and drag her around to all these gardens and she'll right. love it. <laughs> she will love it. And even if mom doesn't love it, take her. <laughs> or to do with the kids. Or, she, right. Yeah. She, could, she could sit in the car and be grumpy. If that's what mom wants to do, that's fine. <laughs> But uh, the, there's going to be a variety of gardens that people can visit, and mm -hmm. um, let's give them the lay of the land. As per usual, just give them an understanding of how this works. Yeah, so it's a private tour, I mean a tour, a self-guided tour of five private gardens, so mm -hmm. people can uh, get a map of all the different locations mm -hmm. and go at their own pace. Um, you can buy tickets to each individual garden, or you can buy a wristband that'll get you entry into all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a pretty fun day. It's a great way to get uh, ideas of what you might be able to do in your own landscape. Mm -hmm. We have a good range of large gardens and small gardens. Right. So, yeah. It's pretty so, so, cool ideas, and I always tout when we talk about garden tours that uh, you often can visit with the gardeners or the designers of the gardens. Yes. And it's, it's a great opportunity to really learn directly from people's hard work. Yeah, and then you can talk with the designers and sometimes the homeowners will be there and they want to show off their garden and mm -hmm. talk about the challenges and how they right. dealt with certain issues and that can be really mm -hmm. informative. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, we're all learning all mm -hmm. the time, right? <laughs> and, uh, and that's what home tours, I think, uh, and garden tours are all about really. It's just another way 
to learn about gardens. And I always tell people, if you want to have a great garden, go look at great gardens. Ah, that's a great, <laughs> yes, that's, that's the way to do it. <laughs> you know, because uh, it's always appropriate to steal good ideas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are the secrets of being a good gardener? <laughs> Theft. Um, so let's walk through some of the other gardens. Mm -hmm. um, there's the, the small, we're going to start with the smallest one on the tour, which yes. I think is appropriate because a lot of people can go over, they see a great big like, uh, estate scaled garden. It, it Sometimes it can overwhelm them. So yeah, seeing something yeah. that's really small and intimate uh, really gives them kind of opens the door in a way. Yeah, I think that's definitely true and we get a lot of requests every year to have small like normal people garden size right, projects. Right, right. <laughs> and this, this one is definitely that um, and it was designed by the homeowner. Mm -hmm. It's on uh, Placid Place. On Placid Place. Right. Yeah. Um, I love it. The house is purple mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, you know, very, uh, very much an expression of the character of the, of the mm -hmm. homeowners there and um, lots of nice spaces. It's almost entirely native plants. There's a mm -hmm. small um, vegetable garden area mm -hmm. and a few herbs too but mostly it's Texas native plants um, very small backyard mm -hmm. and I think they did a really great job of designing the space to maximize the use throughout the space so okay. that's a really good tip when so, you come to look at it and it's in a I know it's in a t fairly tightly packed neighborhood so mm -hmm. privacy is an issue and they've yes. dealt with that really cleverly right with fencing and trellises mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. that both visual screening and also noise screening right Mm -hmm. And also beautiful rock work, mm -hmm. and so it it's, it really combines a lot of things. And it's and on top of all that, it's very lush and yeah. it has a lush feel in some places. Yeah. I laugh because uh, Judy Walther, who designed it, uh, who lives there in her garden, um, she calls it defensive gardening. <laughs> 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 so it's defensive, like with the screening, but mm -hmm. also um, the mail carrier was walking a path through this, so she put in a nice stone patio walkway mm -hmm. just for him. And <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, <laughs> bowing to pressure. That's right. or just go reality, with it and make right? it work for you. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. So that is on Placid Place. And again, a great introduction to the tour if you mm -hmm. want to start small. The next garden we're going to talk about is located on Kathy Cove. Mm -hmm. And uh, w there are a lot of striking things about this particular garden. The thing that, as we were looking at some of the visuals, one thing that jumped out at me was a wall of maidenhair fern is a, in yeah. a water wall. Yeah, really. that is one of the highlights of the garden, I think, mm -hmm. too. And it's great. It looks great all year long. It's very soothing, mm -hmm. you know, seeing maidenhair ferns and trickling water and yeah, the, you know, just there's frogs in the water. Yeah, that just speaks of those beautiful hidden coves in the hill country, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's a nice use of the space that was underneath a deck where it was very shady and they were trying mm -hmm. to figure out what are we going to do with the space and I think that was a creative way to mm -hmm. deal with how uh, with that otherwise dead space and it's really uh, very attractive. Beautiful again mm -hmm. beautiful stonework throughout. Yes lots of extensive stonework. The property uh, this one is fairly large and so there's gardens around the house and it was built the gardens were developed in different stages so that's another thing that you can see how how things transition over the years and as they've done new pieces of it um, and then there's a nice trail that goes through the back. It's more like a nature trail. Mm -hmm. It's not huge, but it's it's yeah. a bigger than a normal lot size. Right. Yeah. So, and I understand this is this was kind of collaboratively done between mm -hmm. the homeowner and uh, some designers. Who yes. the, the designers did the hardscape and the rock work. Yeah. And and the homeowner uh, chose the plant palette. That's it. Right. Yeah. It's a nice collaboration, and it works yeah. out really nicely. Yeah. And well, and that's a, actually a practical kind of median step. Mm -hmm. for the, and the you know the that hard work of doing all the hardscape right. is intimidating for a lot of folks and yeah. requires some you know muscle some power. skill and knowledge <laughs> too. Yeah, right. There's a, <laughs> a little engineering skill. and goes on uh, with that more too. than a little bit of engineering <laughs> on the slope, particularly. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. beautiful work. The next garden we want to talk about is on Mount Benel. Mm -hmm. And we have an image, the first image I saw, there's this grand sweep with silver pony foot and yes. golf muley and it just, it looks glorious. It's very, very beautiful garden. A beautiful home, beautiful garden, beautiful mm. setting. It's on a hillside, which I just love gardens on a hillside with the different elevations and it really, it can, and they did a great, really good job of this too with the stonework of creating these uh, interesting spaces. It kind of divides the space up and you can trail through it and explore and it makes it feel even bigger than it is. Uh, mm -hmm. and very, another very lushly planted lots of native plants uh, to Texas and just different areas to do different activities. And this was designed by a professional, Kurt mm -hmm. Arnett, Kurt who's Arnett. Gonna be, probably going to be on site, we think? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, excellent. And it was installed by Stan Powers, who's another uh, local who mm -hmm. uh, has been on our previous tours before too, and he mm -hmm. does fine work. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, it, it looks like a terrific place to visit and hang out, mm -hmm. so I hope folks will avail themselves of that one. And uh, one of the things that uh, ha is always open on uh, the tour is uh, the Wildflower Center itself, right? Mm -hmm. yes. People can stop by and, be, and participate that way. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the Wildflower Center is looking better than ever, I have to say. Um, we've been doing some new projects. If uh, folks haven't been out in the last year, we have our new Texas Arboretum, which is opened uh, about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely a must see. We have swings there. There's a power line planting demonstration area, like small trees that you can plant under power lines that the city approves of. Uh, yes, <laughs> which is, for example, <laughs> if only the city would pay attention to that sometimes, because I've seen them plant bald cypress under oh, no. power lines. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice trail. Goes. It's very uh, pleasant, and um, you know, people run on the trails. Uh, mm -hmm. It's nicely and improved, so it's level and even, and it's just a beautiful, quiet, serene place uh, at the Wildflower Center. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, l l let's walk through people the basics one more time, just mm -hmm. in terms of it's again Saturday, May 11th. Mm -hmm. People can buy tickets online, or or they can fi find information. I guess find online. information online. Right. Yeah, and uh, there are several nurseries that are vending uh, the tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. Barton Springs Nursery, the Natural Gardener, uh, Treehouse. Um, I'm probably forgetting. I think you could probably we can probably put up a slide of the different places that uh, that are vending those again for us this year, and of course at the Wildflower Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, wh one thing it's always good to check is uh, photography allowed. And all of the homes have photography allowed this year. Oh, definitely. that's good. Yes, <laughs> yeah. We try to get that if, if right. at all possible because I know it's a drag if, if you can't get pictures of, of the garden to see what they look like. Okay. So again, uh, we had the, 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 the three gardens we just talked about, plus the, the one that was we profiled at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, and the Wildflower Center itself. Mm -hmm. It should be a great weekend for people, and we really appreciate you coming There's back. There's one garden that we oh, haven't oh, talked oh, about. Oh, we haven't? Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, this one was on Highland Terrace. Oh, okay. This was another project that the okay. homeowners oh, designed. Okay. It's a beautiful garden. It's uh, mm -hmm. very whimsical. Lots and lots of little spaces for mm -hmm. sitting areas and chairs and quirky, like lots of collections of architecture architectural features okay. and wind chimes and stuff. It's really fun. Okay, very yeah. good. Well, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Absolutely charming looking space mm -hmm. and very individualistic and filled with creativity, so it's awesome. Okay, well, Andre, on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank Great. you so much for being Thank here. Thank you for having me again. Okay, and our friend Daphne is waiting for us. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our question this week is about wildflowers. As you've noticed, our native population is a bit sparse this year. And as you've learned from the news interviews with our local experts, the reason is our lack of fall and winter rain. Spring flowering wildflowers release their seeds in summer. Then, ideally, those seeds sprout with the onset of rain in the fall. But when we don't get any rain in the fall, the seeds are still there in the soil and will wait for better conditions before they sprout. In fact, blue bonnets have such a hard seed coat which doesn't break down easily, so that ensures that the seed only germinates when the environment is most likely to be ideal for the new seedling. As we talked about earlier this year regarding blue bonnets, if you have wildflowers in your landscape, you're subject to the same rules of nature, but you're also more able to manipulate your environment. So if your wildflowers are a bit sparse this year, you'll need to remember to watch the weather next fall and winter and water if we aren't getting any rain. If you want to plant any new wildflowers, remember, the time to scatter that seed is late summer and into early fall, not the spring right now. But it's not too late to plant transplants of Coreopsis, blanket flower, columbine, and blackfoot daisy, and other wildflowers you might find in your nurseries now. If you don't have a spot for them, try some in containers. Just be sure to use a well-drained porous potting mix and not too large of a pot. Our wildflowers traditionally grow in shallow, even rocky soils, so they'll not thrive in very deep containers full of rich soil. If you don't plant in taller containers, just be sure not to overwater, since the soil below the root zone will stay wet and it will encourage rot. Our plant this week would be great in any wildflower garden, but also looks fabulous in more structured beds. Engelman's Daisy, Engelmania peristania. This delicate looking little Central Texas native is actually quite tough. It will bloom its little head off with very little supplemental irrigation even through the driest of times. Although in the intense heat and bright sun of a typical Central Texas summer, the leaves and blooms do fold in on themselves and look a little bit wilted. But this is just a protective measure for the plant to shade itself a little bit. 
Engelman's daisy can be found in both the Edwards Plateau and the Blackland Prairie regions of Central Texas, so it tolerates a wide variety of soil types. But if you have heavy clay soil and you overwater or we get a lot of rain, this plant will struggle and may not survive. Engelman's daisy stays pretty small, only getting about two feet tall and wide. It needs to be planted in the full sun, so avoid areas under trees or other larger plants. Engelman's daisy will be covered in blooms from spring through summer, then will slow down a bit. But if you're industrious enough to give it a little haircut in late summer, it will bloom again quite nicely through the fall. Since there will be so many spent flowers, it will be virtually impossible to actually deadhead this plant, so simply shear it back all around, the way you might if you were shaping a much larger shrub. Bunnies and deer just love the taste of Engelman's daisy, so these plants may not last long if you regularly have hungry visitors to your garden. To do in your garden this week, if your summer vegetables survived the late March freeze that many of us saw recently, it's time to fertilize them. But if you had to replant and the transplants have only been back in the ground a few weeks, wait until the plants get a little larger before you fertilize them. Summer vegetables need a little extra nutrition to produce and provide us with a harvest all summer long. And I'd like to remind you about AgriLife Extension's gardening hotline service. If you have a gardening question, just call us. We have well-trained master gardeners who volunteer to answer your calls. You can also bring by a plant sample if you'd like for us to look at something. Just be sure to call first and make sure that a master gardener will be there when you stop by. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgul for Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. I'm John Dromgul. Well, a lot of new gardeners out there, so I want to explain some things that you might want to do. And uh, to get ready for gardening, you need a good hat, a good pair of gloves, some sunscreen, and a nice watering can. There's all kinds of those out there. You know, garage sales are a good place to go find these things. And so, um, Here's what you need. You need a little trowel. A good trowel is very important. And uh, this one is welded right here, so it's going to last a long time. And look at the thickness of the blade. That's very important, too. Some of these are handmade, and others, and those are the ones that cost a little bit more. And then the other ones are pressed out of a piece of steel and formed, and that's about it. Don't have a lot of strength to them. One of my favorites are these stainless steel types right here. These uh, clean up very easily, and um, I just like them a lot. They do a very good job of cutting, it's got a sharp edge, and um, this is one I'm really comfortable with. But I started with that one. Here's another little uh, digging device in the garden just to kind of work um, your way through the soil. You just flip the soil and work it. Uh, it'll help you make a groove for seeds, uh, very simple stuff. If you're kind of interested in something like this, this is a hori hori, a Japanese tool. It has a sharp edge and a serrated edge right here and a good point on it just to work in the garden. It does a very good job and you'll figure out what it's for including taking up weeds. There's an assortment of different types of tools that will allow you to get in there and do some trimming. This is one of them right here. These are a little expensive. This is the Felco, but you can find some to start with, and um, they're inexpensive, and if you take care of them, they last a long time. Here's one that's a little bit bigger, and you can also get even longer handled ones for getting into a shrub and doing some work that way. But get a good one. You know, it's worth it. You'll buy several of the other types that are inexpensive by the time you did that, you'll have paid for one of these nicer ones. But starting out, you know, we want to save some money. One of the things you're going to see are different types of handles. There's a straight handle. That's the one that we see a lot on a long handle. You can get a lot more leverage, uh, whether you're using your cultivator or your shovel. It doesn't make any difference. You get a lot of leverage out of one of those. Then I like the T-handle and the D-handle. That's what these are. And the T-handle is very comfortable for me. I like to use it for driving a shovel into the soil or a garden fork. This is uh, really nice. But but this is even stronger. This has a piece of metal on it, and that gives this one a lot of strength. And so um, a lot of folks like this one. And once again, in turning in some compost or fertilizer, you've got something to use to twist it in there. And that's a good way to incorporate it into the uh, top four inches of the soil. You know, I'm showing you these good ones, and these are mine, and I've had a lot of time to use them. They're many years old. But um, here's one that's kind of new. It's not that old. The gardener hasn't had it that long. The label's still on it. And right off the bat, in a few days, here comes the fork. It just fell right out of there. And so um, this is one of the problems. And they also bend. 
People tend to use them for taking up rocks and breaking roots, and it's not for that. It's just for working in the soil and um, just getting it nice and deep. Double digging is a technique that you ought to look up. It's a very effective one. So what you see here is a new tool already broken. The wood in there has stretched as they use it, and pretty soon it comes loose. If this happens to one of your tools, well, you can put it back together, put some super glue in there, and then just drive it in and hammer it down in there once again, and it'll work one more time. But it does tend to loosen the wood up and come right on out of there. So. Quality is what we're looking for. Quality is what um, you can pass these tools on to your grandchildren. It'll stay uh, in the family for many, many years when you get a good one. And I like to do it that way. But I know a lot of you don't have enough money or you're not sure if you want to be a gardener for very long. So you might look for the inexpensive ones, try them out, and if you like gardening, and I know you will, you're going to want a very nice tool for yourself. So it's easy. Get some good tools and that'll make gardening a lot more effective. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgool. I'll see you next time. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and check us out on Facebook. Next week we go for summertime flower power. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.